Welcome to another video from Cardboard East. My name's Jay. I play board games from Asia and share what I find with all of you. Are you going to the International Spiel Tag at Essen, the world's largest board gaming convention? No? Well, I'm not either. But Emperor S4 is, and they're bringing all of these games with them to Germany. Now, I've played all of these games, and in this video, I'm going to tell you what I think about each and every single one of them, and what I recommend, if any, or all. Hey gamers, before we get started into the content, I just want to say thank you to all our Patreon supporters. Thanks so much for all your support. It really means a lot to us. We definitely appreciate it. If you like this content and you like the videos that we have, please like and subscribe. And if you think our content is worth a couple of bucks a month, please consider joining our Patreon. Now, first up on the list is Walking in Burano. Walking in Burano came out in 2018. It plays one to four players, so there is a solo option. Now, even though this game came out a while ago, I think this is one of the better games in the entire catalog of Emperor S4. I find myself still going back and playing this one and discovering new things. Typically, I don't like uh, small card games like Walking in Burano, but for this one, it really works. In Walking in Burano, Players will be building their own street in Burano, Italy. You'll be building a grid of five houses, uh, three stories tall, all of them ideally in different colors. And in addition to that, you'll be also inviting visitors as well. Little people that go beneath the buildings to help for scoring issues. Now, the cool part about this is the drafting mechanism, and I find that really interesting. In fact, I'm not the only one, Jamie Stagmeyer, made a video a few weeks ago about how he thought the drafting for this game was quite unique, and he's not wrong. You know, what I find interesting about the drafting in Walking in Burano is that you're not drafting from a hand of cards. Instead, all the cards are laid out in the center of the table, almost like a conveyor belt. And on your turn, you can draft one, two, or three cards. If you draft one, you get two coins. If you draft two, you get one coin. And if you draft three, you get no coins. And I find that interesting. So on your turn, you're always getting cards and you're always getting money. Now, in addition to this is that when you're drafting cards on this giant conveyor belt of cards, you can draft only in one column and you can only go from the bottom up or from top down. You can't go from either side. Now, there's a lot of flexibility in Burano. You don't have to have each column be a specific color. Um, if you do make a mistake and have to be forced to place one off color, you just sacrifice a token and you lose points. But I really appreciate Walking to Burano for that drafting mechanism, for the puzzle of putting your street together. In addition to just these buildings and colors, like each card is a little different. Some of them have like blue plants, green plants, red plants. There's a little cat that runs around on the rooftop. Uh, there are chimneys. There are people on the ground floor going to different shops. And these visitors that you'll be drafting uh, throughout the game are going to be splayed out on the bottom of the street. And these visitors are going to score your building. So maybe one visitor likes cats. So in their column, if there are more cats, you get more points. Maybe one visitor likes plants. So if you have plants on the second row, then you'll get points. Maybe one of them is like the mayor and they need like people on the streets. And one of them is uh, Santa Claus and he wants more chimneys on the rooftop. What I do find interesting about walking in Burano is that there is this nice little puzzle going on. And while it is multiplayer solitaire, and I don't really care about what I'm doing, your draft or the draft of your opponent really affects the gameplay. And I find that to be really rewarding and I find this puzzle worth going back to time and time again. This came out, I believe in 2018, and I still played it this year. So if you're looking for a card game, with some legs that could definitely have some longevity on your shelf. I think Walking in Burano is a good game to add to your collection. Now, Walking in Burano is the first of the walking series. After Walking in Burano came Walking in Province. So if Italy is not your thing, uh, maybe France is. Now, Walking in Province is another drafting game. However, you're not gonna be drafting from a central board in the center of the table. You'll just be drafting uh, hands of cards from your hands, just like normal, or how most games do it. In Walking to Province, you'll be drafting these farmland cards, and you'll be able to place these cards down on the table. And you could overlap and tuck them any way you want, rotate them, any way you see fit. And your goal of this is to rearrange your farm so that your two meeples, a photographer, the, the lady here, and a drone flying up in the sky can take pictures. And you're taking these pictures to race to the milestones. And there's a variety of milestones in the game. 
X amount of fields, X amount of this, X amount of that. You take your picture, and you're the first one on the milestone, and you gain more points. However, there are multiple ways of gaining points in the game, and they all relate back to the cards. Maybe it's the number of big buildings you have, maybe it's the number of vertical purple rows, or the horizontal purple rows, the number of buildings you have. And I do find myself coming back to Walking in Province, not as often as Walking in Burano, but I like this game because it's very relaxing and it's very chill. You can have this on a nice afternoon with a nice glass of wine, just relaxing. I've been an Emperor S4 fan for quite a while now, and hidden within all these cards are little Easter eggs of all their previous games. They have aliens doing a little crop circle. There are ravens from one of their previous raven games. There's the black cat, which follows them throughout most of their games. And there's even a dog. And even though the dog wasn't present in any of their previous games, it was the office dog. And I find all those little additions Really, really cute, and I really appreciate that being in Walking in Province, even though I know that your average gamer won't be aware of these little Easter eggs and won't appreciate it. But if you're looking for nice, chilled, relaxed games, I think Walking in Burano and Walking in Province are good additions to your selection. I think Walking in Burano is a little bit better, but I don't want to shy away and say that Walking in Province is a bad game, because it's definitely not. Now, there are a lot of people who ask, well, there's Walking in Burano, Walking in Province, is there gonna be another walking game? Well, I don't think there is, and we can go back to that in a little bit. Uh, one of the main reasons is that the lead designer of both the walking games and the artist left Empress 4 and began their own publisher. And they're also starting a family as well because they're, they're a married couple. But if you want to see more of their games, well then you could check out Pocket Master Builder. Now Pocket Master Builder has been getting some attention online, and for good reason. It's a tiny little box that's just a deck of cards and a couple of cubes. But inside is a really solid solo Euro game. You can play this with two people, and I've heard people trying to play it with three. But for me, I think it's just better off as a solo experience. Now, I have talked about uh, this before. I did a teach and play and a review of Pocket Master Builder. So please check out those videos. But to summarize my thoughts really quickly, I think this is a really good experience. Most solo board games that are this size don't have as much depth and strategy as this does. It is kind of frustrating because the iconography and the rule book were not that ideal and there was a lot of confusion online but there's a good FAQ and people are answering each other's questions on BGG. So if you are into solo games and you're looking for something that fits in your pocket, well then Pocket Master Builder I think could be a good addition to your collection. Now if you've never heard of Emperor S4 and you have no Emperor S4 games, then I strongly recommend you get Hanamakoji. Hanamakoji is one of the best two-player games ever designed. And for many people, it is their go-to two-player game. And I can never fault them for that because it's an excellent, excellent game. It is the game that built Emperor S4. Hanamakoji is known for the I cut, you choose mechanic. And I think probably implementing it better than any other game that I've ever played. If you're unfamiliar with this, then definitely check out my Hanamakoji series of videos where I talk about this game, I talk about its seven new expansions that have come out, and I also talk about its sequel, Geisha's Road. Now, if you know nothing about these games, I strongly recommend you check out that series of videos because it's gonna answer all of the questions that you have. Now, if I'm gonna choose between these two, I'm gonna probably still stick with Hanamakoji. But that's not to say that Geisha's Road is a bad game. I think for a lot of people, Hanamakoji is like their go-to game and it's been their go-to game for a very long time. And I think that they're looking for Geisha's Road and because Geisha's Road offers a lot more depth than Hanamakoji. In addition to the I cut, you choose mechanic of splitting out cards and vying for the control over these geisha. There's also a spatial element on the side where the geishas are walking around in circles, visiting tea shops, gathering guests, and you're having a set collection with those guests. So there's a lot more layers of gameplay within Geisha's Road. And I think that's definitely targeted towards people who've played Hanamakoji multiple times and are looking to take it up to the next level. But the best thing about both these games are the expansions that come in these Omomuri cases. These are absolutely adorable. These will not be going to Essen, unfortunately. Now, I talked to Eros, the head of Emperor S4, and he mentioned that they don't have enough to bring to Essen. They have enough to give to all the backers and they won't have enough uh, for people at Essen this year. However, they do plan to bring these to Essen next year. 
So if most of your game board nights are you and your significant other or roommate, then I definitely think that Hanamakoji is one that I would strongly recommend. And if you already had it and it's your go-to game, you've been playing this for many, many years because it's come out quite a few, quite a while ago, then maybe you're ready for the next step of Geisha's Road for that added complexity. Now, I've been saying that Hanamakoji and Geisha's Road are part of the Hanamakoji series and this is the sequel, but technically, it's really not the sequel. Emperor S4 has always wanted to make a trilogy of Hanamakoji games about the geishas and there is a little game called Shadows in Kyoto that most people don't really talk about. But I'm here to change that. Now when you play Shadows of Kyoto, you're going to immediately think, this is just Stratego with a few extra rules. And you're not wrong. If I had to compare it to a game, I wouldn't compare it to Stratego, I'd probably compare it to uh, an older game, Confrontation, like The Lord of the Rings. Now, I do admit that I like Confrontation, Lord of the Rings a little bit more, but that's because I'm a big fan of that IP and I'm really into the theme. I'm not so much into the theme of geishas fighting the government, but I do think that Shadows in Kyoto is a better game than Confrontation. Now, in Shadows Kyoto, I really appreciate how there are three ways to trigger the end of the game. You can win the game by either A, capturing geishas of your opponents that capture real intelligence, or you could trick your opponent into capturing your three geishas that have no intelligence. That's like, not that they're stupid, but like secret intelligence, plus secret codes, things like that. They're spies, they're geishas, and they're spies. Or you can get one of your geishas into the temple at the back end, kind of like running through the end zone. Yeah, I'm from North America and I watch football. Now on your turn in Shadows of Kyoto, you're going to be playing either a movement card or a tactics card. You'll be slowly moving when your geisha is up and forward, or be playing like a tactic card and they're going to be warping around the board. Now, like any other card game, there is a little bit of luck with the luck of the draw. There is a good amount of tactile engagement as opposed to long-term strategy. And with some well-calculated bluffing, you're going to have some good times in Shadows in Kyoto. And I definitely think it's one of the better games from Emperor S4. Now, there have been critiques in the past about how the geishas are wooden meeples. And sometimes the wooden meeples, you know, as much as you want, like they're not exactly perfect. And if you own a copy of that, well, then you can kind of tell like, okay, well, that geisha is obviously the fake one. That one's the real one. I'm just going to ignore that geisha. And that's uh, problematic from an engineering standpoint of the game. Emperor S4 will respond to this by offering this elite collection of metal geisha heads. And they are absolutely divine looking. Unfortunately, I think they are a little bit too nice for the board and they kind of seem a little off-putting, but I'm still going to play with them. Now, these were available for the Geisha's Road Kickstarter campaign, and there will be, I believe, like a limited edition at Essen this year. So if you want to grab these beautiful metal statues, then you definitely need to run to Emperor S4's booth before they're gone. In this little box, you'll see this nice uh, foam insert for you to store all these geishas. Now, they even come with the stickers attached to them. So that's something that you don't have to do. Unfortunately, if you want to take this box and put it in this one, it's not going to happen. Even if you take the insert out, it's not going to happen. And that's because it needs to be room for the board. And this is just a certain height and width that it's just not going to fit. Now, you could. Uh, get rid of this box, uh, take this foam insert with all the statues in it, and stick it in here. However, because of this, um, the statues could fall out, and then I don't know what you're going to do. You could put the statues outside of the foam in little plastic bags. It's your game. You decide. I think I'm okay with having two separate containers, and I'm just going to make my peace with that. But these metal pieces do solve that problem of the wooden components, and it does make Shadows in Kyoto that much of a better of a game. So if you're looking to complete the Hanamokoji series, I recommend Shadows in Kyoto. Now, if you're a fan of Emperor S4, then you probably have seen all these games already. So, and you're probably looking for the next two games on my list, and those are the brand new games from Emperor S4. Some people have asked if there are going to be more games in the Walking series, and I said that no, I don't think there are. The lead designer and the lead illustrator have left the company, have started their own company, Pocket Master Builder. But I think that Emperor S4 is going to be focusing more on the cyberpunk dystopian future of their 
Rat Evil series or Rat Evil series. I'm not. I'm not really sure. I'm not sure where they're going for that. Now, World Exchangers is a stock game for two to four players, and I have played this at all player counts, and I've played it in all three variation styles of play. And usually that's normal red flags, but hold on to that thought. We'll explore that in a little bit. World Exchangers takes place over 12 months, so it'll be 12 rounds to the game. Now, the most exciting part of World Exchangers is the personal player board. And on that player board, you will be keeping track of your money. So on your turn, you can either buy a card or sell a card. And I say cards, but they're really cities. You're buying and selling control of these cities because it's a dystopian future. But as you buy and sell cities, you're going to draw how much money you've gained or how much money you've lost throughout the course of the game. Now, if you sell the city on a certain month, well, then you'll increase the profits that you have. If you sell the city on a certain month, notified by the red, then you're going to get an extra bonus and you're going to talk about that in just a second. Now what's really cool about this track of seeing the market going up and down is one, it looks like a stock ticker, that's always really cool. But every time your line crosses one of the icons on the board, you will collect that icon. And that's the heart of the game. You're going to be collecting these icons on the cards that you have in their tableau in front of you, as well as the cards you have on your player mat. And at the end of the game, let's say you have like three blue guy cards and four blue cards, three times four is 12, that'll be $1,200 that you make. And then you have blue, you have green, you have orange. In addition to that, there are these little stars on the player board. Every time you get those, you'll be collecting them as well. And if you get like one, two, three, four, five stars, and you'll get more and more and more points at the end of the game. In addition, there's also this propaganda pyramid. And at the end of the game, Whoever's at the top will get X amount of points, and whoever's at the bottom will get fewer points. So yeah, it's card collection, set collection, and point conversion. Now, some of the things that I mentioned before is that when you sell the card at a certain date and it's a red month, well then you get to draw a circle around the dot. So anything that you circle, you're gonna get as well. So there's a lot of fun timing and buying of which cards to get. Now there isn't a much player interaction, it's pretty much multiplayer solitaire. So if you're looking for an interactive game, this one probably isn't your cup of tea. Now I did mention that there are three ways to play this game. And we're gonna talk about that right now. Normally those are big red flags for me, but not really in this case. The first way you can play this game is with a character card. There are four character cards in the box and you'll just divvy those up amongst the players and they're gonna give you all like a special bonus. So maybe you get a bonus if you collect orange, maybe you get a bonus if you collect green or if you collect blue or if you collect red. Pretty simple. The other variant is that you take that character card and you flip it over. And then before, your pretty average propaganda board suddenly becomes a lot more interesting because now your cube can drop and you can activate a real powerful special ability on your player card. Maybe you can sell more cards at a higher profit, maybe you can buy more cards on the board, maybe you can wipe the entire deck. And that becomes a lot more dynamic about what you can and can't do. However, I think it's the third way to play the game that is my favorite and that's without the character card. Now the character cards I believe are there to kind of give new players a little bit more direction and choice. So maybe I don't know what to do, well now I have a character card who's blue, I should probably collect blue cards. However I find that without the character cards uh, you kind of don't run into a problem that I have with the game. And the problem that I have with the game is that well it's hard for cards to cycle out. Meaning that I buy cards, I put them into my tableau. I sell cards, my tableau goes to the central market. If the central market is ever at two cards, then it fills back up to five. So you'll see a few more cards enter this closed economy. Now, the problem with that is that, well, if I'm collecting orange because my character card tells me I'm really good at orange, but there are no orange cards in the closed market, that's problematic for me. And then maybe Mr. Blue, who's collecting blue, there's a ton of blue out there, so he's at a major advantage. So I find that there is a problem with the character cards because it's not always balanced that way. Now, at the middle of the game, you get to inject more cards into the market, but I still feel that you, there is that imbalance there. Now, when you use the special abilities of the character card by filling them over and you can play the advanced game, that's a little bit more dynamic, and you could buy and sell things at a faster rate, and you have more flexibility with your turns. However, you don't really control how many cards are still in the market. If you're collecting orange and there's no orange there, 
man, there's nothing really you can do. And unfortunately, your player ability is kind of useless for you. I find that if you play without the character cards, it's just as good of a game because now you're a little bit more open and anyone can get blue, anyone can get green, anyone can get orange, and you're looking at the market, seeing what's there, and then it becomes even more interactive because no, well now I'm interested in what you're doing and I'm interested in what you're collecting because I need to make sure that if you're going heavy and blue, you're already ahead, well I'm gonna go green so that way I don't have to fight with you and I can focus more on my strategy. Now, I do think World Exchangers is a unique game. I haven't seen a game quite like that. And I really, really like the board. I really like the drawing of the ticket marker. I really like crossing off the icons and slowly seeing that slow progression. And I really like looking at the cards and seeing which ones are worth more and how the cards could be different at the early of the year, but later on in the year, they're more value. And there is that nice, tough decision making of like, well, I'm trying to collect orange and I'm running out of money. I need to sell something. So to make money, but then I don't want to sell the cards that I have, and you're forced to make these decisions here. Do I really want to get rid of this $500 card, or do I want to wait one more month and then sell the $500 card so I get so I can maximize my profit? Or are you going to prioritize getting the icons on the player boards? I find that balance there really interesting and worth exploring. But these are all the small box games coming from Emperor S4. And if you're looking for the big game, I think the game that highlights this year for Emperor S4, then I think World Splitters is an excellent game. Yeah, that's right. It's an excellent game. Now, just like World Exchangers, I only played World Splitters just a handful of times in the last 48 hours. And I can tell you that I'm really impressed with the design. I really love the simplicity of it. And I'm gonna break down about my pros and cons of the game. But please take everything I say with a grain of salt because I personally don't think that I've played this enough to really give an informed review of it. So these will just be my initial impressions. World Splitters is a two to five closed economy auction game with area control. And that to me is just in my wheelhouse and it sounds utterly amazing. And it, the fact that it only plays at 60 minutes is even more icing on the cake. Now I say closed economy, what does that mean? Well, at the beginning of the game, each player is gonna have $9 and that's it. There's no more money in the game. So if you get $5, I lose four and there isn't any more money being injected into the game. It's stuck at that count. Now there aren't many economy games that do that, but what makes that really interesting is that you really feel the loss and gain of money. And you could look at the money behind your player shield and now gives you a better idea of how much money is out there and how much things are worth in the game. Um, I'm gonna teach you really quickly how you play the game. Um, the first thing you do is you're gonna build a fence somewhere on the map and then you're gonna have a bidding auction. All the other players, excluding the active player, are going to make a bid for that fence. And what are they voting for? Well, they're voting to put their own meeple on either side of the fence. Now, once the bidding is done, everyone's gonna reveal how much they bid. And now, as the active player, I'm gonna look at the highest bid, and I'm gonna have two choices. Either I can A, uh, take the money, and then that bidder can choose which side of the fence to put their meeple on, or I can give that player that much money. So maybe if Tom bid $4 and I can give Tom $4 and I can place my meeple down somewhere between the other side of those fences. And then, after that's resolved, then the second highest bid gets resolved. And so the active player looks at the second highest bid, maybe that's Bob, and Bob bid $2. Well, now I can either give, just the same as before, I can give Bob $2 and place my meeple there, or I can take Bob's two dollars and Bob can put his meeple on either side of the fence. Then once that's done, you'll resolve anything that's happened. And what I mean by resolve is that, well, as you're putting these fences around the, as you're putting these fences around the map, you'll eventually enclose a certain area. And once that gets scored, you'll see who has the most people there and whoever has the most people there gets X amount of points. And that is pretty much just the game. That's the game itself. But there are a lot of subtle layers hidden within design that I find really, really interesting. When I build a fence and I have a lot of money, both the other players are gonna make a bid for it. Well, then I could just give them money and I could place two meeples down on the board. Now, in addition to putting these meeples down and having this area control and slowly building these fences around the board, there are also little icons on the map. There are these red icons, there are these yellow icons and green icons. Red icons are for initiative. And that is the tiebreaker in the game. 
You tie a bid, well, whoever has the highest initiative becomes higher. If you tie the game, whoever has the highest initiative wins. So by collecting these red icons, you are moving up the initiative track and bumping other people down. I find that really engaging. In addition to that, there's the yellow uh, tiles and those allow you to build more fences. So all of a sudden, the fences are growing faster than you had anticipated. Now there are these green icons and they all do something different. And what I mean by that is they're all tied to the map. Now, now remember there are four maps in this game and each map will have its own layout and own set of rules and it'll give you a little bit more to explore. I haven't played all four maps but I'm really looking forward to exploring more of that. Now this game does play from two to five players. I have not played the two player variant uh, but I have played at three and four and I can kind of assume how it's going to play at five. I'm going to say that this game without a doubt is best at three players and the reason why is because during the bid action three players are always going to get something out of it. The Actor player is going to get money or maybe a meeple. The second player is going to get money or a meeple. The third player is going to get money or a meeple. And if you're the fourth player, you might not get anything. Maybe you didn't bid anything, so therefore you don't get anything. And so if you play with three people, everyone always gets something. And that makes it really engaging. So even when it's not your turn, you're still gaining something in your game momentum. And I found that with the four player game, it felt kind of disheartening when nothing happened uh, on your off turn. And in the five player game, I can only see that becoming more of a problem by having, well, I didn't get anything. Oh, I didn't get anything. Now there is a two player variant that I have not played yet. So I can't tell you uh, how that is, but the two player game does inject more money into the closed economy. So I'm kind of curious to explore that in the future. Now I do have problems with this game, but none of that is with the mechanisms of the game. The problem that I have is with the uh, engineering part of the game. And by engineering, I mean the quality of the production. Now these boards should be thick enough. They should totally be thick enough. These are the maps, but we live in a pretty humid island. So some of the boards do begin to warp and that could be uh, I mean, a little problematic, but not much. The other thing is that this fits here on the box and you're supposed to play it like this. And sometimes it can be a little bit like a trampoline. Now I would have preferred it to have been just on the table itself and therefore everyone can see. With it elevated up onto the box, however, it becomes maybe a little bit more problematic because the fences could be just high enough that I can't see over them. And so sometimes there's a lot of bit leaning and leaning over the side to see what's going on. Now, I'm an older gamer, so I like these old, like 20 year old Euro games where everything's beige and wooden components. I really like that. And I kind of wish this was kind of like that as well. But once you put everything on here, when you put the meeples and you put the fences and you put the background, the mountains or the dome base, it looks really cool and it's very, very Instagrammable. I can't deny that. The biggest problem I have with this game is though is that there's this one little piece that you kind of stick onto the fence to signify this is the fence that I just added and this is what we're bidding over. Hi, hi, pay attention to this. It does not clip onto the fence and it's kind of a problem, I think. And I kind of wish they just had like a giant meeple, like um, something like an upside down U that just kind of like sandwiches over the fence and looks really shocking and beautiful and people can see it and like, yeah, we're playing over this. I think that would have been a little bit more ideal, but it's a very small problem. And usually when you put the fence down, everyone knows where the bit is taking place. That aside, I'm really impressed with World Splitters. I think this is a great, great game. And I love how simple it is and how much depth there is to the game. This reminds me of an old game called Santiago. And Santiago is another excellent auction bidding game. If you haven't played it, I definitely recommend you try finding a copy somewhere. But what I loved about Santiago is what I love about this is that the mechanics are very, very simple, but there's a lot of depth in those mechanics for you to have really interesting choices and decisions and how each decision you make slowly layers on top of each other and you get to see the game evolve in front of you. And with the components and world builders, you get to see it evolve in a very beautiful way, I might add. Now there are just some, I do have problems with some of the components so that sometimes it's kind of hard to see and you have to move your head around and sometimes the boards are a little bit wobbly or sometimes they're just bent and that could just be to the environment. They should be thick enough, they should be okay. But all that aside, the actual gameplay itself is fantastic and I really strongly recommend world splitters. I do think it's really interesting. And on top of that, they could have just had one map and call it a day, but they 
included four maps. And I find that really interesting. And I'm really looking forward to exploring more of those maps and seeing more of what this game has to offer. But I do recommend that you play it at three. Four is okay. Five, I don't know if I go up to five. And I still haven't played the two player variant. So later on down the line, I'll probably do a, a full playthrough and review of this game. Because I definitely do think it's a worthy selection uh, to anyone's collection, especially if you like auction and bidding games. And this has been my review of Emperor S4's games coming to Essen for 2022. Check out their booth at 4F100. Once again, gamers, my name's Jay. I play board games from Asia and share what I find with all of you. I'm going to put a link here to some more videos about upcoming games at Essen for you to enjoy. See you. Finish the heart. She's gonna finish the heart because she loves me. Maybe with this hand. But and I'm hurting my arm from my surgery. That's right. Doing the surgery guilt trip. <laughs>